Sometimes some people identify this figure as Nara because he's holding a Kaman Padmavan, a musical instrument here. But others don't feel that he would be in a Jain temple. Though I must tell you that many Jain, uh, I mean many Hindu, uh, many gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon are shown in Jain temples because there has been an intermixture of the religions. There are families where wives are Vaishnavas and the husbands are Jains, so a lot of Hindu influence comes in. But always as secondary gods, always as assistants, not as principal divinities. Next. This, this particular motif is called the Kalpavali. It's a, it's a reason. And what is in it's it's the motif that you would see in many places in Gujarat, in mosques you will see them, you will see them in uh, in temples, Hindu temples, in also in palaces, in places like that, in step wells. It's a common motif. But what is very interesting is the way in which it is done. First and foremost, just look at the swirls, and and within that there are these swirls. Oh. And what is also interesting is the dimensionality of it. They're all in various depths, at various depths. This is lower, this goes in further, this goes in further, this comes out. That, that sort of um, exquisite manner in which the carving is done. Next. Now what is interesting in this temple is you get portrait figures. This portrait is of Dharnaka. Dhar Dharnaka it is called, but this is Dharnasara, the patron of the temple. Now they say that the temple was finished in 1440. It was mainly the inner temple that I showed you, the temple within the temple in the courtyard. That was finished. It was consecra consecrated and Dharnasara was not is it, you know, it was aging and with failing health, he was not sure that the entire temple will be completed in his lifetime. So he consecrated just that one shrine that I showed you. And he has placed this particular portrait of himself in a manner where he can see the divinity, but he's at this height. So no one's head can obstruct his view as he can see the divinity and have eternal darshan. So one pillar, this is where his gate is placed, and on another pillar, you see this is the object. So as you go into the shrine, on this pillar is Dharnasa, on this pillar is the architect. So they have had their portraits. Now this doesn't really represent how they looked. It is just a symbolic representation of what they were and who they were. We even have an inscription here. And of course they're worshipped every day. Next. Then here in one of the porches, right here, is this figure. This figure is the elder brother of Dharnasha, Ratnasha. Who, were, who promised his younger brother that he would look after the construction of the temple even after his younger brother passed away. And he, he is always worshipped because he continued the tradition, he looked after the temple. Of course, the temple went on being built. It was not built in even 30, 40, 50 years. Dharnasa took, maybe he was there for another 10 years. From the inscriptions in the temple, where you see it on pillars, you see it on panels, you see it on various uh, arches and things like that, is that, uh, or these little shrines, is that people were contributing to the building of the temple. People who were either related to Dharnasa or people from neighboring areas. And this was their participation in a religious enterprise. You see, this 
it's interesting that one man conceives it, he gives the maximum amount of money for the main temple. But all the side shrines, all the side colonnades, and the ceilings and all, and each one gives according to his ability. So someone is given for the ceiling, someone is given for a pillar, someone is given for a whole shrine. And you find that those inscriptions, and they say that the temple must have gone on being built for over a hundred years. And maybe it was never completely finished. So here we have Ratnasa's portrait, right here he is given this place of honor. Next. Look at the lighting. This is this is Maru Devi, who comes on an elephant. This legend is that this is the mother of Rishabha, the one who gets enlightenment. When the mother hears about it, she wants to go and meet her son and bless him and get blessed by him in return for having now become a Tithankar. So she is go she goes on an elephant towards where he's sitting in his four in that enclosure with four entrances. And from afar she gets to see him. And the minute she sees him, she dies and she reaches Nirvana. So she in among the gems is the first one in this cosmic cycle who achieved Nirvana. And therefore she is always prayed to. Otherwise we pray to the Thankars or their goddesses and all, but she is prayed to as the first person in this cosmic cycle who reached Nirvana. So here she's, it's, it's quite uh, symbolic here, she's coming on an elephant to see that in four-sided image which is representing Adinath in his son of son. So right from here she sees, you know, it's a line with an image of Adinath, one of the four images. Now in the temple we have certain carvings like this. This is Parshwanath, the 23rd Tirthankar. And he was supposed to have been saved by a snake because there was a big thunderstorm and he had done a good deed to the snake. Actually, it's quite an interesting story. In his previous birth, he was going, he was a prince and he was going on his horse. And he, uh, uh, he saw a Hindu priest doing the Pancha Yagna, Pancha Agni Yagna, meaning he had four fires next to him and the sun above him. So he was sitting there doing this yatna, but in the fire was a piece of wood, and within that wood was a couple of snakes, and they were getting burnt, and he saw that, and he got off his horse, took out the piece of wood, broke it, and released the two snakes. And they were, of course, eternally grateful to him. In his next birth, he becomes a Tithankar, and while he was meditating, the person who was doing that uh, that sacrifice or the Pancha Yagna, Pancha Agni Yagna, he is born as a god for having done all these yagnas. And he he wants to take revenge on Parshva for sort of exposing him by saving those snakes. So as a god, he starts a thunderstorm and the flood waters begin to rise and because he was meditating, he was not going to move. So the two snakes whom he had saved are born as the king and queen of the netherworld. And they come and then they spread their hoods above him and protect him. So this is a very important story among the Jains. Very, very, very much liked and loved. And very often portrayed. But this is one of the best portrayals that you see. Here is Adinath. And here are the snake with his hood is here. And these are his wives, two wives, and their tails. And then the tails of the snake and the two wives all entwined in this wonderful design. So it's as a work of art, it's really very significant and very appealing. And also look at it as a work of art. When you see that how this is not a flat plot like that, it also gently moves like this as as you can see from here, see this, as the hood of a snake hood. So it's realistic at one level, symbolic at another, and 
attractive design at a third level. Next, please. And this this one is a pilgrimage butter, as they say, or representation <coughs> of a pilgrimage place. This is Shatrunjay with its two main temples here, as this is a smaller temple. But for the Jains, as I said, many Hindu legends were given a Jain interpretation. These are the five Pandava brothers who came there and who then get moksha or liberation from the cycle of rebirth. And this particular temple uh, is the pilgrimage place is extremely important to the Jains. And you get many representations like this, not only in carvings, but more in uh, cloth paintings. Superbly illustrated, you know, very colorful with pilgrims going everywhere and all these temples shown. But this is a sort of flat rendition of what you would see geographically, topographically. Next, please. This is the Kshetrapal or the guardian of the temple. He is worshipped every day. They put these glass eyes on them and put silver foil and put all these all this glass. Next piece. And this is in the Jain cosmological pattern. This is an island continent. This is the sea. And this is a continent where there are these Jain temples. They are not they are inaccessible to human beings. Only gods and celestial beings can go and worship them. Now, in the 12th, for, in the 15th century, in 1440, when Dharna Sahib has had completed his inner shrine, at that time, poet Meha writes that this particular Dharna Sahib's temple is like this this land, it is called Nandar, Nandi Shwarthi. Ah, so this, as you can see, is similar. So he compared it to the Nandi Shwarthi. And so, you see, this particular temple was not only admired by all, but also poets wrote about it at that time. Not, I'm not saying later or anything. Contemporary poets wrote about it, they extolled it, they praised it, and it was something of a marvel or a wonder even in those, I mean, certainly in those days. Next. And now as you go, this is now, the priests are sitting here, as you exit, you see this and you feel a certain sublime quality. After having seen everything, being excited by the sculptures, being uh, admired the temple, admired the architecture, as you go, the sort of cool quality, the sublime quality, the quietness, the aloofness of the architecture. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't grip you. Like in a Hindu temple, it's all dark, and you feel part of that uh, being with the divinity and everyone around. Here it's open and it's colonnaded and there's light and white marble and it's clean but it's aloof. And that in a way reflects the Jain ethos of self-restraint, of not being involved, of withdrawing within yourself and contemplation and meditation being more important. So while after the initial excitement, the, the temple leaves a, a, a feeling of being so by yourself, isolated in a wonderful atmosphere. Experience is very different. Next. And we come again to this figure as we exit. But what, what we saw at that time was just a figure. I did not show you the panels around it. And there are wonderful panels of a hunter here, you can see him with a deer. 
But what I want to draw attention to you is this particular <coughs> panel. And that panel shows you erotic scenes. Now you would think in a, in a religion like Jainism, which is in constant denial of sensual pleasures, why would they have a panel showing sexual poses and also bestiality of animal and you know, animal sex and all that? And the reason for that is that it serves a function of auspiciousness. Now, why that is the case, please don't ask me because I am not able to explain it, but maybe Jitubhai or Dr. Tripathi might be able to explain it. But it also plays an atropaic function, which means it is nazar nalabhi. You know, it is to ward off hunger. So these panels are uh, put there. And the, the way that Jains have cleverly introduced it is, it is a panel on the story or the legend of Stuli Bhadra. Now Stuli Bhadra was a young prince who was, uh, who was completely um, involved in sexual and sensual pleasures and enjoying himself. He lived in the house of a courtesan and he was there, there most of the time. And one day he just felt enough and he left and he became a monk. <coughs> And then the next, a few years, or the next two years after that, when the monsoon season comes, when all the monks are supposed to wander and go to places where they can become recluses and they meditate more during the monsoon season, rainy season. When his teacher asked him, what are you planning to do? He said, I'm going back to Kosha, the courtesan's house. And everyone was shocked. He said, I'm going there to show you my self-restraint. And he went there and he stayed there for the whole season. And Kosha was, of course, delighted, but her charms had no effect on him. He was completely occupied in his meditation. And whatever was going around him didn't affect him. And he was able to prove that he could have self-restraint of that sort. So this story, is explained here, and this gives him enough reason to show those sexual poses and all, because it's really the story of Sturi Bhadra, they're not making it up. So, this is the story. Next, please. Here, you can see this panel, the detail. It has a specific function that it performs. Next. And so now we see this temple. You been inside, you come out, and you see now you can see these shrines. There are 72 of them for all the three, 24 Pithankars uh, uh, of the cosmic cycle. All these are shrines with their own little spire. That's the lofty uh, foundation. The main spire. This is the uh, hall, the ceilings, and we saw all these little domes. And I want to draw your attention to this circle. This one. When the armies of Aurangzeb were marching southwards towards the Deccan to conquer the Deccan, his armies desiccated the temple. They broke everything, they you know, ruined it, and they left. So the Jains got together and they decided how do we avoid something like this happening again. And then they built these little round things and they erected minars on it. So from afar it would look like a masjid. And these, then the army, as it is, it was a hilly area. As it was, if you couldn't see it very clearly, you just saw four minars or tops of it. They never came there again and they went away. Yet, this ruse didn't help, uh, help because the uh, temple crumbled in any case and it fell into ruins. And the reason for that was that the area suffered a lot of famine, successive years of famine. People moved away. The river dried up. 
all the trees and all it all started becoming patterns. People just moved away. And when they moved away, the temple was overgrown with vegetation. And then snakes and reptiles and wild animals from the forests behind all made it their, their home. And more than that, it became a hideout for decoits and thieves. And for 200 years, it lay like that. 100, 150 years, something but a longish period. And of course, because it was neglected, it, was, it began to fall into ruins, you know, that uh, pillars crumbled, the ceilings fell down, and all sorts of things happened. At around the end of the 18th, 19th century, sometime around 1880s or so, Sanghapati Hema Bhai Hachi Singh of Andhava came with a group of pilgrims. And when he wanted to go and visit the temple, and then he was told he couldn't go.